What are your thoughts on this passage from Gary Taubes, author of The Case for Keto? Keto diets are based on the proposition that for those predisposed to become obese and or diabetic, carbohydrate-rich foods trigger that predisposition. That isn't because of the calories they contain, as the conventional thinking on obesity assumes, but because of the effect these foods have on insulin, the hormone that dominates the regulation of fat storage and fat metabolism. Insulin is secreted mostly in response to carbohydrates, not just in the form of sugars, starches, and grains, whole or otherwise, but also fruits and legumes, which are the staples of a well-formulated plant-based diet. A high insulin level signals fat synthesis and storage, and a low level, it's release as free fatty acid back into the circulation, observed the Harvard University Me metabolism and diabetes researcher, George F. K. Hill Jr. in 1971, in the prestigious Banting Memorial Lecture at the annual meeting of the American Diabetes Association. This process is like a switch when fat cells sense the presence of insulin in the circulation, as K. Hill described it, they respond by storing fat and inhibiting its release, and we get fatter. When insulin is undetectable, we burn stored fat for fuel and we get leaner. The metabolic state of ketosis, from which the keto diet gets its name, happens when carbohydrates are restricted almost entirely and fat provides most of the fuel for the body. The hormonal insulin-centric regulation of fat storage and fat metabolism remains textbook medicine, yet its relevance to obesity has been effectively ignored by nutritionists and obesity researchers who have overwhelmingly preferred to think that all calories are equally capable of stimulating fat accumulation, that we get fat because we overeat, not because the carbohydrates we consume have some unique ability to stimulate fat accumulation. For some significant proportion of Americans, however, remaining relatively lean and healthy may require minimizing their insulin secretion. This, in turn, means that more or less rigid abstinence from carbohydrate-rich foods. Animal source foods, meat, fish, fowl, and even processed meat, typically make up the bulk of this approach to weight control because they are almost entirely protein and fat with minimal carbohydrates. Until insulin was discovered in 1921 and insulin therapy was put to use in treating diabetes, these diets were known as animal diets. They were the standard of care for diabetes, delaying death in what today is called type 1 diabetes, the insulin-dependent form, and controlling the disease indefinitely in those with type 2, the common form associated with excess weight and age. This is still the case. So again, Dr. Esselstein, what are your thoughts on that passage from Gary Taubes. Well, I once again, Ben, it's nice to be with you and, and with Steve. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Uh, it's always difficult to want to say uh, inappropriate things about somebody else's uh, writings and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that we've had in diet is a plethora of really of books that have been misguided, but they have been successful because as my friend John McDougall says, they say good things about your bad habits. And for instance, we start looking at Barry Sears in the zone, the South Beach diet, Dr. Agatson, the Atkins diet. Uh, then we get into things like grain brain, wheat belly, uh, the keto diet, and uh, really what is so common about <clears throat> all those authors is that none of them did the research. And if you kind of uh, say good things about people's bad habits, you'll have a seller, a good seller. But of the books that are out there, I know of two individuals who did the research before they wrote their book, Dr. Dean Ornish from California, and yours truly, Dr. Esselstyn from Cleveland, Ohio. And what we found that was by eating a, a diet that eliminated the meat and the fish and the eggs and the oil, uh, and it was largely a high complex carbohydrate diet, there was absolutely striking halting of patients who were seriously ill with heart disease. And at the same time, uh, it was interesting 
that they lost their obesity. And the, the paper that I wrote describing our experience in July of 2014, some 200 patients, the average weight loss was 18 pounds in the four years of the study. And it's really interesting when you look at some of the work of others, this may take a moment, but I really wanna comment. I did a little homework on this one. And uh, my good friends uh, uh, and who wrote Mastering Diabetes, uh, Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbero, just a, a comment about the keto diet and that was a, a peer reviewed <clears throat> scientific study uh, out of Korea where they were looking at 129 epileptic children who had uh, the keto diet. And <clears throat> the researchers reported a complete list of early and late onset side effects that included acid reflux, hair loss, kidney stones, muscle cramps or weakness, hypoglycemia, low platelet count, impaired cognition, and inability to concentrate, impaired mood, renal tubular acidosis, disordered mineral metabolism, stunted growth, increased risk for bone fracture, osteopenia and osteoporosis, increased bruising, sepsis, pneumonia, acute pancreatitis, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, elevated cortisol, increased risk for cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis, cardiomyopathy, heart arrhythmia, myocardial infarction, <coughs> menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea, loss of period, and an increased risk for all-cause mortality. Now that's the keto diet. So there's, I just wanted to be sure I was complete with the, uh, with the complications. And I, I don't really think we have to go much further uh, with this. And although when you think about eating meat, I mean, look at the wonderful work of Stanley Hazen, who has shown that when you are an omnivore and you're eating the animal-based products that Dr. Taub, that Ms. Mr. Taubes is discussing, when you're eating those animal-based products, they contain lecithin and carnitine. And the omnivore contains in their gut, in their microbiome, there are bacteria that when they metabolize lecithin and carnitine, you get TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And trimethylamine oxide will injure your blood vessels. On the other hand, when Stanley Hazen took patients who were totally plant-based, totally plant-based and fed them a lamb chop <clears throat> They didn't produce any TMAO. Now, if you keep that up for a number of days, that they will. But the point is when you're plant-based, you do not contain in your microbiome bacteria that are capable of converting animal uh, protein to TMAO. So you save your blood vessels. So when you eat a keto diet, not surprising that you're putting yourself much more at risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's interesting to also look at the, uh, uh, the Tarahumar Indians in northern Mexico. What do they eat? They eat the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. Complex carbohydrate loaded with it. When they were covered, a carefully studied by the late Bill Connor, there was no obesity, there was no hypertension, and most important of all, there were no nutritional deficiencies. And here they are, <laughs> healthier than anybody who was eating those uh, animal-based diets. So uh, the other thing that's interesting is I've just shared with you the study that we did showing that we could take patients who are seriously ill with heart disease and by using whole food plant-based nutrition, we could arrest and reverse the disease. That's never happened with a keto diet. What are your thoughts on this passage from Gary Taubes, the author of The Case for Keto? When I started reporting on this subject as a journalist 20 years ago, virtually no meaningful research had been published to test the claims of the diet 
book doctors, most famously Robert Atkins, who advocated this way of eating. Since then, carbohydrate-restricted diets, keto or otherwise, may have become the most tested diets in history. The website clinicaltrials.gov reports more than 100 clinical trials of ketogenic diets in progress and nearly 90 completed. The findings are consistent. Ketogenic eating is safe and effective at controlling both weight and blood sugar. Pick a disease from Alzheimer's and anxiety disorders to traumatic, traumatic brain injury and tumors, and researchers somewhere are probably testing whether eating a ketogenic diet improves its prognosis. In 2019, the American Diabetes Association concluded that low carbohydrate and very low carbohydrate diets, that is keto, were the only dietary therapies that consistently resulted in beneficial outcomes for adults with diabetes or prediabetes. In 2017, more than 100 Canadian physicians co-signed a letter to Huffington Post declaring that they personally follow keto-like regimens and now counsel their patients to do so too. What we see in our clinics, these physicians wrote, is that blood sugar values go down, blood pressure drops, chronic pain decreases or disappears, lipid profiles improve, inflammatory markers improve, energy increases, weight decreases, sleep is improved, IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, symptoms are lessened, etc. Medication is adjusted downward or even eliminated, which reduces the side effects for patients and the cost to society. The results we achieve with our patients are impressive and durable. So again, what are your thoughts on that passage from Gary Taubes? That, that's your kind of ridiculous because what you do is you select oh, those 100 doctors. What about the other 100,000 physicians who would be perhaps totally in disagreement with that? And what, what you read me is just a lot of uh, anecdotal material. There's no solid studies that were there whatsoever. When you think about uh, uh, the studies of Neil Barnard, who took, again, he was, Gary Taubes was mentioning the American Diabetic Association. Neil Barnard took the American Diabetic Association diet, compared it with whole food plant-based nutrition in a number of patients who were diabetic. There's no contest. They were blown out of the, the American Diabetic Association was blown away. And there's something a little bit nerve, makes us nervous about the American Diabetic Association, because when they were uh, uh, question uh, in conspiracy cow of their relationship uh, to uh, meat and animal industry, uh, the interview was halted. They refused to answer their relationship to the meat industry. So a little bit like some of these other organizations, which really uh, are existing for their, for their own benefit, let's say, yeah. All right. I think we've, uh, we've had enough of Gary Tabs. <laughs> you have said that we can make ourselves heart attack proof. What is the basis for you making this claim? Well, again, uh, what was, it was started, by t it's, what, it's based upon two studies that I've done. Uh, the first one was a small study was uh, 18 patients who were seriously ill with cardiovascular disease. They had failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for these procedures or they had refused. And then my late brother-in-law used to refer to these as Dr. Esselstyn's walking dead. Uh, but they complied with whole food plant-based nutrition. <clears throat> Not only did we halt their disease, but there was significant evidence of disease reversal. This was confirmed by angiograms. It was confirmed by pulse volume. It was confirmed by PET scans. So we, uh, uh, we found that what seems to happen is <clears throat> the plaques that these people have, have a cap, all right? This is and how most heart attacks will occur is when you're eating the Western diet and eventually in this cascade of oxidation, you begin to form enough foam cells and the foam cells uh, secrete these nasty metalloproteinases 
stromelicin, elastase, collagenase, myeloproxidase. What the metalloproteinases do that is so bad, they erode the cap over your plaque, all right? It gets so thin that the sheer force of blood racing over that cap tears it. Now you have the seminal moment in heart disease. You have ruptured your plaque. So now the, the contents of the plaque begin to extravasate out into the flowing blood where they activate our clotting factors like platelets. In a matter of minutes after you've ruptured your plaque, you now begin to form a clot. And the clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, now suddenly the clot is totally occluding, blocking the artery and all the downstream heart muscle starts to die. That is a heart attack. So how do you keep that from occurring? This entire cascade of events that leads to the formation of plaque is interrupted when you're eating whole food plant-based nutrition. You don't weaken the cap over your plaque. You actually strengthen the cap over your plaque or you eliminate it entirely. And that way, if you cannot rupture the cap over your plaque, you have now made yourself heart attack proof. Where do you stand in terms of fat? Uh, many respected authors and doctors recommend whole food plant-based fats such as avocados, raw seeds, raw nuts, and olives. What do you think? Yeah, I, if you look at page 69 of my book, patients who do not have heart disease, I have no problem with their not eating nuts and nuts and seeds. If patients do have heart disease, I like them to have on the, perhaps a tablespoon or two of chia seeds or of flaxseed meal, uh, lots of green leafy vegetables. Uh, <clears throat> because by getting rid of the saturated fat, I mean, I'm a little fussy in patients who already have heart disease. They've had a heart attack, what have you. And uh, the idea of their continuing to eat an excess of saturated fat, our diet is by no means fat-free. There's going to be plenty of, uh, I should, let me mention for a minute, what are the foods that we recommend? We recommend all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels. 101 different types of uh, legumes, lentils, and beans. All these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and some fruit. And there are hundreds of wonderful recipes in multiple books by authors who are plant-based as to how they eat that and it's safely. But what are you getting with that? You're getting <clears throat> all your essential fatty acids. You're getting omega-6 and you're getting omega-3. But when we talk about, if you add now, the, what are the foods that injure the endothelium? Because here's an area where all experts would agree. Where atherosclerosis or heart disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which is that delicate innermost lining, the endothelium. All right? Why is that dangerous? Because the endothelium manufactures that absolutely magic molecule of gas, nitric oxide, which is the salvation and the protection of all of our blood vessels. And let's just discuss for a minute, what are the functions of nitric oxide? One, it keeps all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four is the absolute key a safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaque. So literally everybody on the planet Earth who has heart disease, whether they're from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, 
or Melville. If they have cardiovascular disease, it is because by now in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck. They no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages or plaque. But the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to understand that never again are they to pass through their lips another morsel of food that is going to further injure an already train wrecked endothelium, then the endothelium begins to recover makes enough nitric oxide so we can not only halt disease progression, but we often see elements of disease reversal. So now what are the fats or the foods that for our patients we eliminate because these are the foods that injure your endothelium, ready? One, any drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures endothelial cells, as does anything with a mother or a face. Meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, eggs, and anything that is dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. And don't like sugary foods, that is cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. Don't like sugary drinks, diet colas, Pepsi, and Coke. You want to be sure to avoid nuts. That's peanuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, and avocado. Oh, I grant you avocado is delicious. But what we're doing for these patients is we're eliminating the foods that have saturated fats and are able to injure endothelial cells. Finally, Coffee with caffeine, decaf, okay. Coffee with, a caf coffee with caffeine injures the endothelial cell. So that's pretty much uh, the, why we, uh, that's my answer to your question uh, about, uh, about fat. And what we've got to document that now is uh, really with several hundred patients who we've reported on and other, another thousand who have gone through our study uh, who, uh, who have not yet been reported. I'm going to ask you just a little bit more about oil. Uh, we know where you stand in terms of oil. Um, many respected authors and doctors do recommend flax, flax hemp, and olive oil. Uh, what do you think about that? Why do so many other authors think it's okay? Um, and is oil as damaging as animal products? Uh, I would say that I would ask you of the, uh, you mentioned that the, many doctors feel that this uh, olive oil is okay. Have they ever performed studies taking patients seriously ill with heart disease and reversing it? No. And a lot of the studies that come out, if you look carefully, the authors of the study are in the employ of the oil industry, all right? And I wrote a paper in the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention in 2019. The title of the paper that I wrote was, Is Oil Healthy? And I review the animal studies and the human studies showing how oil injures the endothelial cell. Why is cardiac disease not as prevalent in half of the world, such as in rural China? When you look back in the rearview mirror, we've known for over a hundred years that there are multiple cultures on the planet Earth where cardiovascular disease is very infrequently identified. And the common denominator is that all those societies were eating largely whole food, plant-based nutrition with none or a minimum of any oil. And uh, uh, is there any more to that question? 
No, just just again, you know, really uh, the, the why why is cardiac disease not as prevalent in half the world, such as rural China? Well, I, uh, yeah, I'll take for example the the Tarahumara, the Papua Highlanders, uh, rural the Okinawa, rural China, and Central Africa. I mean, those were classic. Now, once, as they become Westernized, though, <laughs> just to, to emphasize the point of nutrition, when they get Westernized, or when they move to this country, they absolutely are clobbered with a cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Why did the World Health Organization state about carcinogens, or what did the World Health Organization state about carcinogens in red meat in 2015? Yeah, that was uh, really a kind of a classic moment, historically, to think that in the WHO, the World Organizations, with representatives from all the various cultures, that they came to an agreement that red meat had the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. I ought to cinch up that one pretty tightly. Please discuss how the foundations of heart disease occur at an early age. Well, in answer to an earlier question, I mentioned that all experts would agree that where heart disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we injure the delicate innermost lining called the endothelial cells. But, and that's because the endothelial cells in turn are making nitric oxide, <clears throat> which is their great salvation of all our blood vessels. However, in this country, do you think children ever eat French fries? Do they ever eat lamb chops? Do they ever eat ice cream? Yeah, when, I mean, look, all these things do what? They injure the endothelial cells. When you stop, start doing autopsies on 12 years old, 12 year olds who have died of accidents uh, or suicides, what have you, you already see this fatty streaking on their uh, arteries. And if you look at, uh, this is a wonderful study, 1999 of, young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides. The disease is ubiquitous, everybody. As a matter of fact, the, the, the precursor to that study came out of Korea uh, when they looked at the autopsy of our battle casualties 80% of those average 20 year olds already had gross evidence of coronary artery disease. You could see without a microscope, not enough for their cardiac events yet. But so here we are and you graduate from high school in this country, you get a diploma, but you also get the foundation for heart disease. So is it any surprise that we, we approach our late forties and fifties in this country, we begin to see this tsunami of a disease which we have been culturing and encouraging and ever since we were kids, eating the very foods that begin to destroy uh, the lining of our blood vessels, yeah. Please uh, discuss the 1951 study from The Lancet where doctors Storm and Jansen analyzed the death rates from stroke and heart attacks in Norway. Now, that was really a kind of an interesting classic study in The Lancet. What Strom and Jansen did is they recognized the fact that when, in World War II, when the Axis powers of Germany overran the, the Western countries of Holland, Belgium, they occupied Denmark and Norway, and characteristically, the Germans would take away from those countries, they would take away their livestock, their cattle, their pigs, their sheep, sheep their chicken, their turkeys and so forth were gone. And suddenly now these Western European nations were plant-based. And it was interesting how Strom and Jansen tracked from 1927, right up through 1945, 46, they tracked the, the death rates from heart attack and stroke in Norway. And it was characteristically to, to see 
those death rates going up 1927, going up 1930, going up 35. Then in come the Germans in 39, 1940. The heart attack and deaths from heart attack and stroke plummeted. 41, continued to plummet. And in 1945, what happened? The death of Adolf Hitler, the cessation of hostilities in the European theater. Immediately, back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, back come the heart attacks. Pretty classic, but sadly, uh, we just didn't get it. When do you recommend people get heart surgery and when can you instead use diet and lifestyle? Are there times when heart disease is too advanced to treat with diet and lifestyle? There are two wonderful studies. Uh, one was Orbita from uh, England and the other uh, was ischemia uh, at the American Heart Association meeting in uh, November of 1999 in Philadelphia. Now, in ischemia, there were 5,000 patients. To qualify, they all had to have, that is, for, the, for your audience who doesn't know what the word ischemia means, that is a less than normal blood supply to the heart where the patient has a diagnosis of coronary artery disease. And uh, they divided those 5,000 patients into three groups. One was optimal medical therapy plus stents. One was optimal medical therapy plus bypass. And the third was optimal medical therapy alone. Now, before I tell you the results of that, remember, none of these patients were an emergency. Everybody has agreed that when a patient is in the middle of having a heart attack, a stent or bypass can be absolutely life-saving. However, when they're done electively, this is, this is a different situation. When they look, when they, the results of those studies after five years, between those three groups, no difference in terms of major coronary events, heart attack, stroke, and death, okay? Now, my criticism of the study is, compared to what our patients are receiving, which is whole food plant-based nutrition, do you suppose that for five years, those 5,000 patients, not one of them was having a drop of oil? <laughs> now, they were all eating green leafy vegetables six times a day. They were never eating dairy. They were never eating sugar. No, it was mostly, mostly with drugs. And the, uh, but the, the, the whole point of the study though, is that before you subject to these patients, to the, invasive techniques of stents and bypass, which clearly have more deaths. I mean, you can, the deaths when you have a stent is of 1.2 million people having stents, 1% will die. That's 12,000 people. If 500,000 people are getting a bypass, the mortality is higher at 3%. And that's 15,000 people who will die that year. And how many, if it, eating a diet would do that? So we've got a ways to go, especially uh, if we can get these investigators to increase the, uh, the plant-based diet uh, in a manner that will help the patients remain heart attack proof. Of all the people you've advised over the last 30 years who follow your advice, what were the results? What percent got to their optimal blood sugar, blood pressure and weight what percent reversed major health issues and what percent didn't get the expected results? Yeah, for that, I think we uh, to talk now about the second study I did because after the first study, although we had absolutely striking results of disease reversal, it was, as I mentioned, it was small. And of course our critics said, Dr. Esselstyn, this is a small study. It wasn't randomized. Uh, it's a, your diet is very strict. Uh, and I'd like to address that for a minute. When people say that our diet is strict or extreme, uh, what we are simply doing is this. 
We're simply taking away the foods that every time they eat, you eat them, they injure the lining of the artery. If we were to take our diet to Okinawa, they would first thing they do, they would look at us with a quizzical look on their face and said, Jesus, you guys have finally gotten around. To, we've been doing this for 500 years. What made you catch on? <laughs> so the most severe extreme strict diet is really the typical Western diet that 98% of Americans are eating that guarantees that they were going to perish from some sort of chronic illness. So let's get that extreme stuff out of the way. So what are the results with our second study? This time, 200 patients, two are lost to follow up. So when we followed them up close to, close to four years, uh, <clears throat> several things were ap apparent. We were criticized because uh, others who have tried it said they, their patients wouldn't comply. Well, of those uh, 198 patients, 177 were compliant with our diet. That's 89.3%, almost 90%. Now people are astounded. They, how, Dr. Esselstyn, do you get 90% with that diet? A couple of points to be made here. If you're going to have a patient make a lifestyle change, you've got to show the patient respect. The only way that I know to show a patient respect is to give them our time. And what we're doing now, once a month, I conduct a single day, five and a half hour intensive counseling seminar where patients are gonna learn all about how they created their disease and precisely how we are going to empower them as the locus of control to halt and to reverse their disease. Now, also, since I'm a little old fashioned and compulsive, uh, my secretary will give me a list. Usually we limit this to 18 or 20 patients. She'll give me a list of who's coming with their phone numbers 10 days before the seminar. And I will personally call every one of them myself so I can get my arms around their story and at the same time permit them an opportunity to ask questions of me so that coming to the seminar, we have a strong platform from which we can all move forward. So that was some um, um, important thing, a bit of background and why it is I think we are achieving that degree of compliance. Now, the other uh, thing that of the 177 patients who were compliant, close to four years, one patient had a major cardiovascular event, small stroke, when he was in China, he had a tendency to have high blood pressure, totally was eating off the economy, all that salt, his hypertension soared, got a small stroke in his cerebellum, but recovered. Now, what about those patients who are not compliant? Those 21 patients who are not compliant, 62% had disease progression. So, on the one hand, six tenths of a percent, one patient out of 177 who misbehaved. So it's, I don't know how it can be more powerful than that. Yeah. You've spoken a lot about heart disease. Does the diet you recommend also help prevent cancer? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we did not specifically study that. Uh, but anecdotally, in that initial, initial group, who were all men, uh, over a, a follow-up of 20 years, none of them developed any uh, cancer. But that's, uh, like I say, that's anecdotal. I would not, I am not going to tell you that that was rock-solid research. However, it's interesting that when you want to look from a, a sort of an ep epidemiologic standpoint, one of the reasons that I got into this in the first place is when I was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force at the Cleveland Clinic in 1983, 84, I was beginning this increasingly disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And that led to a bit of global research. And it was quite striking to see that there were other cultures where breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States, like Kenya. And in rural, rural Japan in the 1950s, 
breast cancer was very infrequently identified. And yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. Perhaps even more powerful was if you look at um, Japan in the 1958, how many autopsy proven deaths in the entire nation were there from prostate cancer? 18. One of the most mind boggling public health figures I've ever encountered. By uh, 1978, 137 had died, which is still pales in comparison to the 28,000 men who will die this year in this country from prostate cancer. And then there was the work of, uh, again, of Dean, of Dean Ornish, where he took patients who had early prostate cancer and was able to show early prostate cancer get a reversal. And it was interesting that if you grow prostate cancer cells in a petri dish and you introduce serum from somebody who's eating a standard diet, it will suppress the cancer growth by 7%. However, if you introduce serum from persons who are plant-based, you suppress the cancer by 70%. So there, there's, it's an area where it's certainly a great deal of research still has to be undertaken and uh, we'll see what happens. How important is it for us to eat green leafy vegetables? Is it better if it's raw than if it's steamed? Is it still beneficial if we don't add vinegar to it? Uh, you know, <clears throat> by now, I think your audience is familiar because I've said it on, on multiple occasions in this conversation that the <clears throat> It is the endothelial production of nitric oxide that protects us, all right? Now, therefore, it's also important for your audience to know that the endothelial production of nitric oxide, which is that magic molecule, is age dependent. <clears throat> you never heard of a boy or girl who was eight years old having a heart attack, right? They've got nitric oxide coming out of their ears. I mean, it's, but I mentioned that by age 20, uh, 17 to 34 in that autopsy study, the disease was ubiquitous. But even if you're beautifully healthy and you're 50 years of age, you now have 50% of the nitric oxide endothelial production that you had when you were age 25. And when you're over 80, you've lost 70% of that endothelial production of nitric oxide. So. What we try to do with our patients is take uh, advantage or take really a, a lesson from the newer research in the last 12 or 14 years that has shown, have shown us that uh, the body has an alternate pathway besides the endothelial production of nitric oxide, an alternate pathway to make additional nitric oxide. What is that? Well, obviously for patients for cardiovascular disease, we want antioxidants because that's what their plaque and blockage is. It's an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation. So we need antioxidants. So do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work. It's gonna be harmful. Therefore, we want you to get your antioxidants from food, fair enough. What food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So this means if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, blackberries on your morning oat cereal, that's a terrific start. However, nothing, nothing, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So among our patients with heart disease, I'd like them to chew, not smoothies or juicing, I'd like them to chew a green leafy vegetable roughly six times a day, approximately the size of half of your fist, after it has been boiled in water or steamed, so it's nice and tender, five and a half minutes. And then I'd like them to anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic or rice vinegar. Why? Because research has shown that the acetic acid from those vinegars will restore the nitric 
oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. The second benefit from chewing the greens, it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cells. What do they do? The endothelial progenitor cells replace our senescent injured worn out cells uh, uh, and uh, re replace our senescent injured worn out endothelial cells. Now, the third benefit from chewing the greens. Now this is the absolute key. When you are chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew the green nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce that green nitrate that you're chewing to a nitrite. Now, when you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce that nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So when you think about it, pretty exciting. For minimal expense, no hideous side effects, six times a day. That means from dawn to dusk, morning to night, all day long, you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which has given you this disease in the first place. Pretty darn exciting to think you can do that with a vegetable. Now, there's some caveats to this. Toothpaste with fluoride or public drinking water with fluoride and mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in the mouth. And we do not like patients to take antacids if they can avoid it because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitrite <clears throat> to more nitric oxide. Now, you probably are wondering, what are the green leafy vegetables that I'm suggesting? They are. <clears throat> Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top five are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. And Ben, look what it does for your memory. <laughs> Do you recommend bariatric surgery? You know, it's interesting how, when, you th <laughs> when you think about it. How much bariatric surgery do, do they do in this, with the Tarahumara Indians? <laughs> They're never obese. How much do they do with the Papua Highlanders in New Guinea? Or anybody in, in Okinawa who hasn't been exposed to the United States Air Force PX diet, but are eating a typical Okinawan diet or rural China or Central Africa. No, obesity doesn't exist. And, you know, is it, would it be better to eat a horrible toxic diet and have to have bariatric surgery in this country or would it be better to do what some of these other nations are doing? I think history will uh, record, for example, I, it comes to, uh, to my, uh, my head. When I first went into uh, general surgery in uh, 1969, uh, uh, one of the most common operations there was in surgery was gastrectomy for duty and ulcer disease. And uh, there were all kinds of arguments about what was the type of gastric resection ought to be done. And then lo and behold, what should happen? I mean, there were, there, were, there were entire practices where surgeons only did was this gastric surgery for duty and ulcer. And what happened was uh, these two guys from Australia, I think Warren and Matthews uh, said, you know, these gastric specimens that you surgeons are handing off to us after you remove them, they have bacteria. But the surgeons who were so wise would say, no, no. This is a stomach with 10th normal hydrochloric acid. There can't be any bacteria there. Well, they stuck with that and they analyzed those bacteria and they did the experiment on themselves. 
and they discovered the bacteria was Helicobacter pylori. So when these patients come in with problems with duodenal ulcer, all you had to do was give them two weeks of antibiotic. It was completely gone, no operation. So what happens historically, when we look back at that era, it was just crazy. And the same thing happens <clears throat> in breast surgery. Uh, when I, <clears throat> Halstead, Johns Hopkins, William Halstead, in 1882, devised the radical mastectomy. He was such a towering figure that all of his residents who went out to become chairman of surgery departments perpetuated this. And for really, for 100 years, the radical mastectomy was a standardized surgical error. And they were absolutely tough, hard, bitter arguments about this. And finally, it was all put to rest when a, a large randomized control study was done clearly showing the radical mastectomy, which was very mutilating and disfiguring, was no more curative <clears throat> than lesser procedures. Now, the same thing I'm, I just know is gonna happen in bariatric surgery. People are, are just not gonna <laughs> continue to be treated with that kind of surgery. And then, and then now, of course, it has the, these side effects. And many of those patients after a period of time will regain their weight. So it would not, so would anybody, I mean, I've had a patient who weighed 500 pounds come through our program. I just got a call from him last week. He's now lost 200 pounds. He's no longer in congestive heart failure. No, no operation. Just spending time with the patient and having him have a willingness to make significant nutritional change. Yeah. A recent study claimed vegans have more bone fractures. Is this true? You know, I haven't had a chance to really review that, but I, uh, <clears throat> if you notice, and if you read my book, the diet that we propose <clears throat> is whole food plant-based nutrition. And when you look at what our vegans are eating, vegans can eat French fries. Vegans can eat oil. Vegans can, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> glazed donuts. Uh, and so I, uh, my preference would be to look at whole food plant-based nutrition. Uh, and I'm not, not really quite sure until I see that study. Uh, uh, but remember the key thing in, in osteoporosis, people are getting an adequate amount of calcium, so forth, and vitamin D. Uh, the bones love stress and walking doesn't do it. But uh, as you get older, you wanna be sure to still have some stress on your bones, whether you wanna do it with, I mean, granted, things like deadlifts and lunges and, and squats with a weight have proved to be beneficial for restoring and turning around osteopenia. Uh, but those can be a little cumbersome and perhaps for many people, it's easier just to get a knapsack with a number of books in it. So it's got some weight and maybe wear that uh, for several hours, uh, hour, maybe an hour or two a day. And then your bones say, wait a minute, when did so-and-so gain this weight? Then they respond to that stress by uh, strengthening. Sometimes it's easier to buy a weighted vest over the internet. You just mentioned the calcium. Obviously, we, we need calcium. What's wrong with cheese? Well, you know, that's about the worst food you can eat. I mean, cheese is just terrible with all that casein, and, which is the major protein in dairy. And casein was beautifully shown by studies with T, my friend T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study, uh, how important that was in, in promoting cancer growth. And there's a wonderful study from Harvard showing how aggressive casein is in contributing to vascular disease. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any argument there. Cheese is just, it's, all it is is loaded with, with calories 
and other nutrients that are going to injure you. And what about yogurt? What's wrong with yogurt? Don't we need probiotics? Well, no, wait a minute. Uh, yogurt also has casein. Eh? We just talked about that. So it's, it's the same argument applies there. And do, don't we need what? Uh, yogurt, uh, probi probiotics that come with oh, the yogurt. Yeah. Uh, the whole probiotics thing is still, I think, so far from being solidly researched. No, I, <clears throat> I think it, probiotics, is that what the Tarahumar are eating? <laughs> is that what those people in Okinawa are eating? Probiotics? Or the Papua Highlanders? No, I, that's, that's really wait till we got absolutely rock solid research. It's really, I think what constantly comes back, and we're going to come to that when you ask me about supplements, time and again, if you look carefully at it, you get your supplements, you get your vitamins and nutrients safely from food. Your body knows how to deal with it. But when you wander away from that and you start taking these mega doses, that's not the way the reactions in the body were designed to be. And that's why we often see increased risk of heart disease or cancer in those supplement studies, yeah. What's the impact of fast food on injuring our endothelial cell system? It's legendary. Legendary, fast foods, come on. Yeah, that fast, fast food diet, you goes up, you go to McDonald's, Burger King, uh, that's, that is that just destroys your endothelial cells. Yeah. You said that a whole food plant-based diet would eliminate heart disease. Would it also eliminate strokes? It certainly will go, uh, uh, see there are two types of stroke, uh, and, and, and embolic stroke or, or rather hemorrhagic stroke because people who have high blood pressure and hypertension, and it will help the patients with hypertension have fewer strokes. Uh, the other stroke is the typical ischemic stroke that was the same kind of narrowing of the vessels in the going to the brain or in the brain that we see with, uh, with heart disease. So that can be an enormous benefit to prevent those people from having stroke, yes. Is there a way to stop cancer from spreading if you have it and stop it from coming back for people in remission? I think the only tumor that I know of there that would have, uh, it would be interesting to know that, I, I mentioned the, uh, the how little prostate cancer there is in the nation of Japan in 1958. It was 18, 18 cases. It's also interesting that if you look at the observation of uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the surgeon who for years was a, a missionary at Burkett, Dennis Burkett. He was a missionary from England in uh, Africa he was there for 17 years. During the 17 years that he was there, he saw one patient with cancer of the colon. Huh? And guess what? It was in another missionary. Not in, any, not in any of the indigenous population. Now, to the answer there, can you re reverse cancer with, with diet? It's pretty... Uh, which what is still lacking is, is a good study where patients come in with breast cancer that may have metastasized to their lung, their liver, or their bone, and have them be on a plant-based diet and see if their disease can be arrested and grow away. There's some suggestion that it may be slower because the uh, same study that I mentioned to you earlier about growing a petri dish with prostate cancer and introducing serum from somebody who is an omnivore versus somebody who is plant-based and how it would markedly retard the growth. That same study has been shown in a petri dish with breast cancer, but I'm not aware of clinical studies where that's happened because <clears throat> what is really going to be required is we have got to get farther and farther down into understanding really at the cellular level 
what it is that keeps that aberrant cell type going. Something has initiated. Something has initiated one of our cells into a cancer cell. And once that has now been changed, that, can, that cancer cell now is replicating. So one way to prevent it, obviously, is to prevent the, the problem in the first place. And the other way is to suddenly, uh, somehow uh, get enough knowledge that we can somehow change where that cell is, that is a cancer cell, back into a normal cell because it just, that template is still there. But I guess the, the honest answer, therefore, is really once it's, once, once it's metastasized, it's going to be very challenging. Uh, even all of this chemotherapy we have, uh, once in a while, there's a striking result in, with some chemotherapy, but that's the exception rather than the rule. What should a man or woman do if a mammography, MRI, or other diagnostic test finds something in their body that could possibly be malignant? Should they biopsy it? Should they remove it? Should they treat with mainstream protocols? Should they consider alternative protocols? Well, I, I think the, I thought about that for a while. <clears throat> what is so absolutely imperative in all these health issues <clears throat> is to have an absolute rock solid diagnosis from which to move forward. So you can get a, a hint you can get a start by simply an examination. Maybe you can feel something that's abnormal. Maybe you'll see it on an x-ray. But uh, I would, <clears throat> in most of those situations, I think once you have a biopsy and you know actually whether you've got something that is benign and harmless, you can just leave it there. Or maybe it's malignant that ought to be treated. Maybe it ought to be treated with surgery. Maybe it'll have to be radiation. Maybe it'll have to be chemotherapy. But I think what you really want to move from is a rock solid position of knowledge so that all treatment must be predicated on having an absolute solid diagnosis. What can you do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's and memory loss? You now this is about 50% of people who are over by 80, by 85. 50% of people will have dementia. Now that's a hell of a reward for a lifetime of hard work or what have you. And <clears throat> as this has been more and more studied, there are some uh, persons who perhaps unfortunately in have an inherited gene, ApoA4, which may make them <clears throat> more prone to develop their uh, dementia. Uh, but if you look at uh, books like The Alzheimer's Solution uh, by doctor, the doctors Shirzai, uh, Dean and Aisha Shirzai. <clears throat> there are ways, um, nobody I think has really yet honestly reported at being able to reverse <clears throat> established dementia or Alzheimer's. However, what appears to be important to prevent it, that is one of the earliest signs of dementia is mild cognitive impairment, okay? And if you can take these patients at the time that they're diagnosed first with mild cognitive impairment, and if they eat plant-based, exercise, maintain social interaction, especially with friends, avoid sleep apnea, these are some of the absolute uh, key things <clears throat> that seem to push back and delay uh, this progression uh, into dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. How does a man protect against prostate problems? Well, let's go back to this. That's the third time I've mentioned this study. In Japan in 1958, Autopsy proven deaths from cancer of the prostate, 18. There's your answer. You eat plant-based starting at a young age, and you're probably not going to have, you're going to have a minimal likelihood of developing prostate cancer. And also, it probably is not going to 
be as likely to grow. And how do you prevent diabetes? Well, again, type one diabetes, you know, you're probably going to have a tough time preventing that's some, some pancreatic injury that we're not yet fully uh, aware of, uh, whether it's due to uh, the products in milk, as has been suggested, which uh, in that situation, there are milk antibodies, which as your body fights it, the milk antibodies are so apparently similar to the beta cell, which produces insulin in our pancreas that our own bodies are destroying our beta cell production of insulin. Uh, type two diabetes, again, most of that is gonna be lifestyle. And it, the way to protect is by eating whole food plant-based nutrition. This is again, the elegant studies of Neil Barnard uh, showing how you could uh, reverse diabetes. And he uses an, I think a, uh, an image that really the patients can relate to. That is to say, think of it this way. You have insulin from your pancreas, which normally is going to escort the glucose in your body uh, into the cells to be metabolized. But the insulin to escort the glucose into the cell to be metabolized, the insulin has to turn the key in the lock to escort the glucose in. But if persons who are gained overweight, it's the muscle cells, which suddenly are getting fatter and fatter. And that fat in those muscle cells seems to work like glue and you can't, the insulin cannot turn the key with the glue in the lock. So as soon as you can get these patients to get rid of their weight, they metabolize the fat or the glue out of the lock. And once again, the insulin can escort the glucose into the cell because when it's filled with glue and the insulin can't get it in, then the insulin backs up. And that's what we call uh, insulin resistance. What about eggs? Are they healthy? What about egg whites? Yeah, let's let's just talk about the egg. I think for this, I made a special little effort to be up, to, up to speed on this. This is a study that was done by Dr. Zong and his colleagues, and they looked at some 27,000 uh, people, actually 29,615 people, they were pooled from uh, a number of well-known studies, the uh, atherosclerotic risk in communities, the coronary artery risk development in young adults study, the Framingham Heart Study, the Framingham Offspring Study, the Jackson Heart Study, and the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. So these are really sophisticated studies. And the researchers discovered that the risk of developing and dying from cardiovascular disease, including heart disease, stroke, and heart failure, were increased in those who regularly consume dietary cholesterol or eggs. For every additional 300 milligrams of dietary cholesterol consumed, the risk of cardiovascular disease increased by 17%, while the risk for mortality increased by 18%. With respect to the consumption of eggs, the scientists found that for every additional half an egg each day, the risk for cardiovascular disease was up 6% and mortality by 8%. Yeah, so it's uh, really, again, it's animal protein and cholesterol, not a good thing. So then what's wrong with eating fish? Everyone says it's healthy. Well, if you want a diet, a steady diet of mercury, dioxin, and PCBs, you got fish. Where do they, there is no such thing as an organic fish, farmed or in the ocean. There's so much contamination. And really, the way they uh, harvest fish is almost evil. Because you're, you're, bulldoz you're bulldozing the ocean. You're screwed, you're getting, and the ones that, you, that you've killed and you don't want, you just throw them back. I mean, it's just uh, terrible. And what does it do when you eat them? 
Ansel Keys did autopsy studies of the Eskimos who were eating fish. They're loaded with atherosclerosis. Yeah. What do you recommend for someone who has gastrointestinal disease? Well, you know, that, we, that, that can be pretty uh, uh, involved and extensive. Because remember, the gastrointestinal tract starts at the mouth and goes all the way to the bottom where the sun doesn't shine. And let's say uh, you start with GERD, gastrointestinal reflux disease, right? Where you have gastric acid refluxes up and the acid will burn the lower part of your esophagus, which has a lining that was never diseased, excuse me, that was never designed to be bathed with gastric acid. Now, most patients are being get, given a bunch of antacids for this, and then uh, that commits them to almost a lifetime of something that has often side effects. And I've just said earlier how antacids will reduce the gastric acidity, and if you're trying to make extra nitric oxide from chewing the green leafy vegetables, you'll not be able to do it because of the antacid. However, uh, Rarely during the day when somebody is sitting or when they're standing, they're not going to have much in the way of any reflux because obviously gastric acid is a, is a liquid and it's not going to flow uphill. So when these patients really burn their esophagus and injure it is when they're lying down at night. They're lying in bed flat. And if you have an incompetent gastrointestinal uh, esophageal sphincter, then the gastric acid will just roll up into your esophagus and create its damage at that time. So what we've always done, which seem to be effective, is if you get the patients to elevate the head of the bed on six inch blocks, never try pillows, they don't work. Elevate the head of the bed on six inch blocks so you're sleeping on a slant. Uh, other gastrointestinal disease while we're at the stomach. We talked about peptic ulcer disease, which actually nowadays, you don't have to have surgery for that, but by taking antibiotics, you can kill the helicobacter by pylori. That's the case. Obviously, if you have gastric cancer, well, that should be excised surgically. Uh, when you get down to the uh, small bowel, you may have things like Crohn's disease or even in the large intestine and the small intestine can have ulcerative colitis. What seems to be very beneficial there is actually whole food plant-based nutrition, interestingly enough. And you want to do everything you can to protect that tiny layer that exists on the colon that protects the colon from the endotoxin that are being pr produced by the bacteria that are in our uh, that are in our intestine. Uh, diverticulitis is an interesting one. Simply again, because of the relatively slow transit time and tendency to sluggish bowel movements with the Western diet, when pressures get so high in the colon, there is uh, extravasation of the of the mucosa right up alongside where the blood vessels normally go. And sometimes when a bit of fecal material becomes inspissated and that extravasated mucosa, it gets inflamed and now you have a, a diverticula, which now is diverticulitis. And when those, you, those usually can quiet down with an episode of antibiotics, but then be sure the patients do have plant-based nutrition so there's less higher pressure and less likely to have that recur. Uh, obviously, appendicitis is a common uh, entity, and although it's usually been removed with surgery, they are now carefully looking at whether sometimes that can be managed with antibiotics. Uh, still in the gastrointestinal tract, in usually this is in uh, infants and children, 
a thing called Hirschsprung's disease. And that's an inherited abnormality where the, uh, uh, the muscle fiber of the colon lacks the nerve that is going to make a transit. And those patients actually can be helped when the, when the segment of the colon that lacks these nerve endings is removed. Uh, the constipation obviously can be resolved with again, plant-based nutrition. As to, and uh, I think the same thing can be said for irritable bowel disease. And the thing that comes re echoing through in all these GI situations, except maybe Hirschsprung's that inherited one, is the benefit of fiber. You just cannot get enough fiber. Yeah. And uh, what was the rest of that question? Um, but you know, really just, that was it. What would you recommend for people who have gastrointestinal disease? Yeah, I just start from the top and go, go to the bottom and, and there, are, those are the answers. Why were there so many young soldiers with gross evidence of coronary artery disease? Well, I'm, uh, you know, that's the study that I've talked about already in Korea where they, uh, uh 80% of those average age 20 year olds at autopsy from battle uh, casualties already had gross evidence of disease you could see without a microscope. Yeah, those, uh, they were all eating uh, the, Western, the Western diet. They were, uh, that, was, that study was confirmed as I told you 45 years later, looking at this time young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 and the disease now was ubiquitous. Yeah, it's the Western diet. Are lectins in plant-based foods a health concern? No, if you uh, if you if you uh, cook, that should not be an issue. Should we try to avoid add or avoid salt in our diet? How big a problem is salt? What health problems does it cause? Why do some people say we need salt? Yeah, I think that when you overdo salt, there. I think the data are pretty clear about a tendency to have high blood pressure, hypertension. 1,500 milligrams is what's you, be the, usually the limit. Uh, uh, we personally do not cook with salt, but if you encounter something that seems a little bit tame or the food's a little flat, you get such little, when you use a salt, when you get so, using a salt shaker, you get so little that uh, that seems to be a safe way to get around that. Although, fortunately, many times the food has such delightful taste, there'd be no need for it. You know, you're going to get all the sodium you need through the foods you're eating. What did Stan Hazen find in regards to lecithin and carnitine when ingested through food? What's the difference in those with carnivore diets and those with plant-based diets? Yeah, well, what Stan found was that in persons who are omnivores, uh, and whose diets contain lecithin and carnitine, they have in their gut bacteria that will convert the lecithin and carnitine into TMA, trimethylamine, and that will be rapidly oxidized by your liver to TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, and that is what injures blood vessels. When he did this study, not with patients who were omnivores, but were plant-based, gave them a lamb chop, checked their blood for TMAO, no not there. So if you're plant-based, you're protected from having TMAO. And it's another reason why, and those who are pushing any kind of animal protein or meat, tell them, look, if you want to, you want to make TMAO and get heart disease, you eat the meat. What's been the response in the medical world to your studies showing how diet can dramatically reduce or eliminate heart disease? Well, the, the initial, obviously, it usually takes about between 17 and 20 years for some uh, new uh, idea or concept to get into the, the medical vernacular inter interim. Uh, the first study I think I mentioned since it was small, but we had absolutely striking results. And these patients who were they uh, failed their first or second bypass. They had failed their first or second angioplasty. They were too sick for these procedures or they had refused. And <clears throat> we just began to see this striking 
halting of any disease progression. And often we saw evidence of disease reversal. And, there's, and these patients and the initial group were followed up uh, before I published them over 12 years, which is almost half a career. It made it one of the longest studies in the medical literature on this type of approach. And yet, obviously, there are many people who were threatened. I mean, I'm an enormous threat to medicine's biggest cash cow. Just imagine if patients with heart disease, <clears throat> if they came in, instead of giving all these expensive pills, procedures which have high morbidity and mortality, like stents and bypass, and suddenly you could just heal them with Brussels sprouts and broccoli, you're going to offend a lot of people <laughs> and upset. So, you know, the criticisms are valid. We, our study was small. All uh, right, it wasn't randomized, right? And it was a very significant diet change. Many people said that we can't get our patients to eat that your diet. And uh, so uh, it was this same study, as I told you, was again repeated. And we, I went through that. We had 90% who were compliant. And literally, uh, there was no disease progression, except in one patient who didn't follow the, the program in those. So it was, uh, I wanna be sure I'm answering the rest of this question. Ben, could you read that again? Yeah, just really what was the response from the whole medical world yeah. to- Well, what, well, what happened, well, that was back in 1980s, early 90s when we first did this. And uh, Ornish, same thing. But uh, what happened was slowly it has taken on. But for instance, I now am a member a fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We started out with maybe four or 500 physicians, but went to 1,000, went to 2,000, went to 3,000, 5,000. Same thing is happening in the plantrician organization. All these physicians are fascinated and interested in plant-based nutrition. So really what you've got now is this groundswell of interest, enough so that even, here's how the, you see what's on the wall. You ever hear of Tyson, the food mannequin? But yeah, they are now figuring out a way to make a plant-based chicken. <laughs> ah, or is it, or some, some, something so similar. And there are other uh, uh, burgers that are appearing that are, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, mimicking something that is uh, plant-based, but trying to make it taste like meat. So uh, anyway, there's no question that the, the tide is coming. And I think that uh, once we can ever get the government to clean up its act and, and tell the American what is the safest diet, for instance, this, when the USDA makes a food pyramid for the American public every five years, if we can get, ever get them to take off the very foods that they always have on there, which when consumed will guarantee that millions of Americans will perish. When you can get a food plate for the public made basically from plants, there's going to be a hell of a day of reckoning as the chronic illness begins to disappear. How do we make sure we get enough minerals from our foods and how do we make sure we're not missing any key ones? Yeah, to, to do that, I did a little uh, more homework for you here. And if you'll bear with me, uh, this is going to be in the American Journal. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Yeah. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Fair enough? Yeah. This was, uh, sorry, I've got a little machine here that's making. Uh, this was uh, uh, authored by David Jenkins from Toronto with about 15 other authors. authors. And they looked at supplemental vitamins and minerals for cardiovascular disease prevention. And their conclusion was conclusive evidence for the benefit of supplements across different dietary backgrounds when the nutrient is sufficient has not been demonstrated. Okay, none. But what about vitamin D and calcium? Randomized controlled trials 
failed to demonstrate cardiovascular benefit with vitamin D supplementation. Right. And therefore, calcium supplementation should be used cautiously, striving for recommended intake of calcium predominantly from food sources. In this review, the authors examine the currently available evidence investigating whether vitamin D and calcium supplements are helpful, harmful, or neutral. So I would think that if somebody is eating a spectrum of plant-based foods, just like Bill Connor looked at with the Tarahimara Indians who thrive on uh, uh, really beans, corn, and squash, they had no nutritional deficiencies. Your body knows how to extract these nutrients from food. Now, I will make one qual qualification. I'd like my patients to, do, to take B12. Which of these sources of information on health and nutrition do you trust? And which do you assume are biased because they've been financially influenced by big industry? The FDA, the USDA, the media, universities, scientific community, government agencies, politicians, clinical trials, medical journals. Again, who do you trust and who don't you trust because of perhaps uh, financial influence, uh, influential uh, well, they're all, they're all at risk for really, uh, I mean, I did uh, look up something else that I thought would be pertinent here. <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with Marcia. Marcia Angel, she was for 20 years the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, perhaps the most prestigiously thought of scientific journal. And here's her comment. It is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. I think that answers the question. Which nutritional supplements do you recommend everyone take? Vitamin B12. Do you recommend eating the new vegan burgers that are made from a variety of pea and similar proteins? Uh, ben, we just went over that. And uh, they're, 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 uh, you look at them and uh, the uh, Beyond Meat or something like that, loaded with oil, which you're going to injure, loaded with heme iron, yeah, that's, those, those things are all harmful. There's no studies on those showing that you can halt or arrest your disease. Yeah. There may be something coming down the line, but not yet. Why was it important for you to come speak here at the Real Truth About Health Conference? I wanted to simply have an opportunity to, uh, once again, share my kindred spirits with you and with uh, Steve Shore. And uh, it was an opportunity to update with, with my research and some of the clinical strategies we have for arresting and reversing heart disease. And I guess, is that the last question? Because I would simply say by, uh, finish by saying that here I am something like 21 years out of, or having retired from a career in general surgery. And I find myself really uh, as passionate as ever about the field of medicine, because really I see in the future, hopefully the not too distant future, <clears throat> a seismic revolution in health. And the seismic revolution in health that is going to occur is not gonna come from the invention of another pill another drug, drug, another procedure, or another operation. The seismic revolution in health will occur when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle and most specifically 
the nutritional literacy that will empower them as the local as the locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness. Thank you. With that, thank you very much, Dr. Esselstein. We really, really appreciate it, and uh, good to see you again. Did we uh, did we make the time cut off? <laughs> I, I, I think I think we were exactly ninety minutes. <laughs> so. Uh, again, thank you so, so very much for, for all of your work and for sharing it here with us and our audience. Uh, incredibly meaningful, and we, we right. really do appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Carry on. Be well. Be all well. Right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.